Welcome back, everyone. We are live for another episode of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, as always, Jack Greenstock, joined, as always, by an amazing panel. And I'll pass it first off to Spartan Growing. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, I'm feeling way better. I was just a little sick last week, so feeling good and ready to uh, chop it up today. Um, I'm Spartan Grown. You can find me on Instagram at Spartan Grown, all one word. Or if you don't do the social media, you can shoot your questions to SpartanGrown at gmail.com. Just shoot me an email and I'll try to help you out there. Good stuff. Glad to have you back. You can also find me, Jack Greenstock47 at gmail.com. If you're not on the social media, thank you for reminding me about that, Spartan. Next up, we have Matthew Gates. Yeah, hey everyone. This is Matthew Gates, and I'm excited for another IPM related topic when it comes in, hopefully. Um, if you have information or you're curious about pests and things in your garden or growth space, you can find me in two places. Sync Angel on Instagram and on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. Good to have you back. Next up, we got Dr. MJ. Hey guys, Dr. MJ Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. I am excited to be back on the show again. I had to come this week because I've been gone so much lately, but I'm going to have to cut out early. I got family visiting, so I will go, I don't know, I'll try to stick around for the first hour, but I'm happy to be here with everybody and stoked to be talking about cannabis. Good stuff. We got a couple of topics we're going to touch on first and maybe about the one hour point. I'm thinking about sending the Zoom link to the chat. So anybody who's here that we recognize who would like to join us for a little bit could probably come on at that point. We'll have extra slot available or two, and maybe just have people come on one at a time and talk a little bit about their garden and ask some questions. But before that happens, we have Russ Brandon. Welcome back. What's going on, everybody? Glad to be here. Um, if you guys aren't, for the listeners that aren't familiar with me, you can find me on Instagram at rust.brandon, and you can find a link to my company, Bokashi Earthworks. I specialize in biofertilizers and microbial inoculants, and a link to my company, Black Label Organics, which is a farm that I uh, co-own and run with my partners in Oklahoma. Always good to have you back, and last and certainly not least, the American one. Cheers, bud. Oh, Jack and panel and everyone in chat. It's good to be here. I'm the American one on the YouTube and the American one underscore with underscore Akeens on the IG. Uh, most of you can find me easily. And um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have Spartan and Doc back and uh, missing predicated breeding. But uh, hopefully everybody's good. And uh, yeah, glad to be here. Glad to have you back. I have mentioned many times we're on your Amy Aces, and I just realized uh, I was talking about how it foxtailed a little bit. Realized yeah. um, I used my PPFD meter, and at one point it was just under 2000. So I had it way too close to the light. So I had to dial the light down and pull that branch a little bit away. But uh, right. yeah, the rest of the canopy was still getting a lot of PPFD. It was between like 900 and 1300 in most areas. Uh, but I have lots of CO2, thankfully, that made it up for it. And they're, they're actually looking very healthy despite that. And uh, super frosty and going to yield well still, but uh, definitely should have used the PPFD meter earlier in there. But we have a question. Uh, I think this is pretty much directed at myself and Spartan Grown from Salbly Denberg. It says, uh, it would be cool to go over SIP type containers on your show sometime, since you're one of the only shows I know that has at least two SIP growers. Just throwing it out there. So shout out to them. I know Spartan has a different style of container than I do, but it's also a SIP. So I'll pass it first to Spartan Grown to uh, just kind of describe your setup, what the brand you have is or whatever, and how you run it and what you think about it. And then maybe I'll give my thoughts. Sure. So SIP is just, it's just stands, it's SIP. It stands for sub irrigated planner. So that's all a SIP is. And what that means is, is that the water is, there's a water res underneath the soil column or the soil block or media. It doesn't have to be soil, I guess. And uh, the roots can access that water by growing down into it or through wicking. Most of the water is done through wicking from that subterranean water source, I guess is the best way I can put it. Um, the, the planters that I use, I've used, I bought one earth box and I didn't like it, the size and dimensions of it. So then I switched to, uh, they're called city pickers and you can get them at most department store like hardware stores like low or Lowe's or home depot menards around here ace hardware might have them i'm not sure but uh even the big stores like the big grocery stores like walmart and uh and uh meyer up here in michigan 
they have them in the garden section too. And there's different sized ones. The ones that I use hold 1.5 cubic feet of soil or media. And um, I get them right at the store. I can go right to a department store and get them whenever I need them. So that's pretty cool. Um, and as far as growing, the only thing different that you're doing is, is um, your watering your watering is a little bit different. Instead of uh, your traditional water style, you're looking through a feed hole or a feed tube, usually a PVC tube of some sort, to see down into that reservoir whether there's water or not. And the way that I do it is, is I let that reservoir empty. I don't put water in there every single day. I look down there with a flashlight and if I see water down there, I don't water it. If I do not see water down there, I do water it. And other than that, it's pretty much the exact same as far as growing wise and taking care of the plant wise goes. Yeah, it's definitely not a huge adjustment, especially if you're already growing in soil. The uh, bottom watering is, um, I have one question, I guess, on when you transplant into it, how long or how many waterings do you give kind of top feeds before you go to more of a predominantly bottom fed? Okay, I won on transplant that's it that's because here. because the soil gets enough moisture into it that it's it's going to even out throughout the whole soil block at least in my experience i've dug through them and it's pretty much even all the way through there's not like a dry pocket in one section and you know a wet pocket in the next section the mix that I, i'm using i don't know if i'm lucky or it just happens with every media but i mean it's pretty pretty what do you want to call it pretty even all the way through as far as the moisture level goes I've had the same experience and I know that you use a mulch layer on the top. I use the like shower cap style. I'm going to share my screen real quick to pull up one of your posts on Instagram. I think this is uh, maybe in a city. Oh no, that's actually your outdoor one in the pot. Yeah, this is my outdoor. Yep. Yeah, that's just a smart regular pot. old fabric pot planted halfway in the ground. Like you've mentioned in the past, but you uh, have to scroll pretty far back, but I actually have a post on here that has a broken down like slideshow wise. So you can see each step of filling these things. Here's a, at least the example of the plants in the city pickers, um, the square shaped terracotta. Is it plastic? The sides? Yep. Yep. They're plastic. So it looks like my, I have the same thing, like uh, terracotta colored, but it is plastic. I thought when I was looking at them that they were actually terracotta and oh. um, it's actually, in my opinion, a little bit nicer because they're not going to break. It's a little bit lighter and they last a really long time, but um, that gives you an idea for the people out there that are wondering what the city pickers look like. And we could probably yeah, find that mulch one. layer is just sticks and you can see it. Those are just the stems from my harvests. So I'm generating my own mulch too, by just chopping up the sticks at the end. I think this is another one in the, this is a velvet punch phenol four. I think this is a really short yeah. spotty one. And yeah. uh, this thing's a beastly little plant. That thing was a monster beast, man. I mean, it was so it was like outdoor stock on the indoor plant. It was crazy. But yeah, definitely. Um, I think the city picker style is really great, especially how you've got them set up with the uh, orientation. You're able to fit more in that space because I've only got uh, the actual earth box fits my space almost perfectly. So I just have one and uh, it works for me, but it's essentially the same thing. But instead of having a mulch layer up top, I have a, uh, basically a elastic, uh, stretchy, like shower cap style thing that stretches over the top. And that allows the water to wick up the sides and basically, yeah, sub irrigated pot, sub irrigated planter, whatever you want to call it. Sips, I think are a great way to grow an organic. You can even make one out of a five gallon Home Depot bucket. Like I've described a few times in the past, I should probably share a screen that at some point to give the actual diagram. But, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we get into some of the chat Q and a and just general discussion is uh, the American one. You had a little update on a fire that's happening right now by uh, Ital foundation, Instagram. Yeah. I, you know, I it just was breaking. Like I, they had a live up on Instagram and I hit the live button and then they're just showing this billowing smoke in it's a Capella, California. Um, that's yeah. It was just, I don't have much information other than it, it, they said it started like an hour ago or so. So I'm just pulling up their story right now on Instagram to see if it's something it might not be. I don't think they uh, saved the live stream, unfortunately. I was just curious if there was anything. Uh, maybe we, somebody in the chat will give us more updates, but hopefully uh, people are safe and taking the necessary precautions to make themselves and families safe because uh, sometimes it's a bummer to lose the garden. In fact, one of the people we were going to have on last week 
uh, Ben Familiar, who might be a guest on the show in the near future, uh, he lost his garden up in NorCal to a fire last year. So it definitely happens. And uh, Subcool, rest in peace, lost his house and garden to a fire. And so unfortunately, it definitely is a problem. Uh, it continues to get worse each year, it seems. Um, the cause behind that is definitely there's many folds, but never a good thing. But people got to be safe 100 percent. And uh, apparently it's that, the Hopkins fire, just to interrupt and say that for anyone who's curious, I think you're talking about the Hopkins fire. No, I'm glad you gave some more specificity on it. So that way uh, people that listen afterwards can have a reference to look back because kind of important to think about like when it starts and then how large they get, how uncontained it or contained it will be. Um, we just saw Aaron over the past few weeks has missed a show with, uh, I think, Caldor fire. And um, yeah, it's definitely a real issue in California, especially in the Northern California area. The, another question following up the uh, SIP conversation was uh, growing it with LEDs, uh, the temps get up to 85, water and SIPs getting too hot. Uh, do you have any concern about that? For me, the temperature at the lower part of the grow room is typically, I want to say 10 degrees cooler than the hottest part up at the top of where the canopy is. It's like usually in like the high 60s, low 70s, I would say, versus the canopy is like high 70s, low 80s, ideally 78 to 81 or 82. Um, 85 is definitely higher than I'm comfortable keeping it. If it's like that for a day or two, okay. But uh, ideally you want to vent that out or maybe condition the air somehow to cool it down. Yeah, I would say this is one of the issues with uh, the method, although you're not really, I mean, one of the things that happens with warmer water is it doesn't hold dissolved with oxygen. Um, that becomes a problem for anaerobic bacteria and for plants, although with the SIPS method, you're not really depending on oxygenated water as much as you are with a top feed method. The one thing that benefits like uh, the SIP style of growth, I use Brandon's Micro Plus, but any uh, facultative anaerobe uh, microbes that can work in that environment. And the other thing is, I think it holds, I want to say two and a half or three gallons in the reservoir, but not filling it to a hundred percent capacity. So if you're thinking about the pot, uh, let's say the top 80% is medium, uh, your soil, the bottom 20% is a uh, reservoir, right? And let's say I fill 10% of that reservoir, there's still that 10% air gap between the roots can hang down and have some air, some water, and also be in the soil. So I try not yeah, to fill exactly. it all the way until it's overflowing. So at least there's some air kind of accessible to the roots, hopefully at yes. all times. Yeah. And just with the whole bottom feed method, there's always going to be sort of more oxygen in the rest of the root zone that, that can somewhat compensate for the lower dissolved oxygen content of the water. And that's really why I've, inf that's why I was the theory behind why I water the way I do. I don't fill them every day. I let the, that reservoir go dry because I want that air pocket to uh, almost like it's not a dry bag. We're not, I'm not going to call it a dry bag, but I want the air pocket to increase. I want to have increased amount of air just to err on the side of aerobic over anaerobic. And, and that's why I do it. And you really consume all your water, which is awesome. You don't have runoff. And it's, it's very like, if you check, I check twice a day. You have a pretty good grasp on how much water they're taking up when they're taking it up. This is a Cheddar Bob 13, a main grower who's growing some cherry pie and some earth boxes outside. You'll see when he goes down and pans down in this video, he lifts up this. This is the earth box style that I'm using. Look at these roots. Unbelievable. It's just filled out that pot so well, in my opinion. I mean, for organic soil, it's got access to like the, I think there's a lot of worm castings and other high nutrient content at the top layer. Well, that's and, what it should look like under your mulch layer too. Yeah. So it's, it's working uh, as it intended. And you can see these are some big healthy plants. So cheers to Cheddar Bob. When I saw this, I was like, damn, like I've had my roots pretty close to that, but this is one of the better examples I've seen of somebody peeling back the thing and just having really beautiful white, yeah. uh, just tons of like fish bone and a whole bunch of thick, furry, healthy roots. So uh, these things can work really well with cannabis and uh, just wanted to give a few examples for the people out there that are curious what they look like, how they work. Yeah, um, and egg, you'll see that referred to as plastic mulch. 
I mean, you'll, you'll see them run a whole row of that down like acres of fields. <laughs> yeah, um, I live here in uh, near Carlsbad, California, where there's uh, strawberry fields where there's just tons of it. Uh, it's not my favorite for large scale ag. I think they can do like I saw Grandmaster Level had some outdoor stuff and I thought it was plastic and somebody made the comment like, oh, there's so much plastic mulch. And then he goes, this is actually like fabric paper or something, but it looked like a plastic mulch. So similar concept, but I think it's more biodegradable. Um, so ideally going for that or just like a natural mulch, like a straw, hay, um, anything. I think even like wood chips, but people get really upset when I say that. <laughs> I think it can work. Um, I've well, seen chips works. So you just don't want to bury them in the, in the dirt. Once they start to decompose, they'll start actually pulling nitrogen out of the soil. The fungi needs it to help break that stuff down. That's a great point. And, uh, it's all about the intention and, and how it's used. It, it's got to be applied properly. And, um, you know, with the consideration that there's lots of things within the wood chips and if it does start to break down, it's going to vastly change the water holding capacity, uh, structure and so many other things within the soil. Trying to get back over to the live chat, maybe give uh, the people some options like a poll uh, or even ask the people what topics would they like to hear? Does anybody on the uh, panel have any topics they're thinking about? I'm sure Matthew has an IPM one. I'll throw it to you first. And uh, any pressing IPM topic or just general? I saw an article for that spotted lanternfly that my good buddy Matthew Gates had been telling me for like a year about. I'm like, damn, you guys are late to the game. What the fuck? <laughs> Who cares about bugs, right? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I uh, I was I was on the Future Canvas project recently on their second channel talking about um, various topics uh, like the like the case of haploid viroid and, and other pests and things like this. We did a little bit of identification of a of a caterpillar, though a couple of different insects as well. Um, uh, you know, lately I've been finding, you know, that I made the root me the bug video recently from Chile and, oh, I guess an update on that. Um, the 50 degree, the 50 degree Celsius water bath on the roots did work and it didn't shock the plants. Maybe people could consider that for other things too. Um, I'm not sure if it would be a good uh, control for something like the rice root aphid. Although I think I have heard of what people was, doing something like what that. What was the before. application rate on it? It was just water. It was just hot water. Just really hot water. It was 50 degrees Celsius. That's super, and super hot. It is pretty hot. So hot enough it's to not be quite sterile. boiling, but is it hot enough to be sterile though? Uh, pretty, I'm just worried. Pretty like, close, I'm maybe. worried that I would. Oh, 50 my... degrees Celsius is like what 120 ish. Yeah, um, so not like perfectly sterile. You could still put your, I mean, you could still get into water that's that hot. I mean, that would be a pretty hot, hot tub. I was going to say, it would be a kind of a hot jacuzzi. Right? Yeah, but it's not like boiling. It's not sterile or anything like that. It's not you boiling. Could still, I, I mean, you could still leave your hand in it. 122 is definitely not hot tub, though. Like the hottest hot tub you'll ever get in is like 106, 107. After that, there's like, it'll start damaging your body and like give you like flu lights. Yeah, symptoms. well, there's like thermal baths that get up to like 120. But yeah, they tell you not to stay in them for like more than 30 seconds or something. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but so you can, you can. I mean, it's not like getting into boiling water, you'd be instantly killed. Agreed. But it's definitely not good for those mealybugs, bugs, apparently, which is a good strategy. I, I love the temp gun because I'll go over to my sink. And as I'm running my water into my uh, little, you know, uh, pitcher to pour it into the plants i'll shoot the laser in there and i'll see oh it's uh 66 degrees i'll turn it a little warmer and try to get it right on 68 because uh, that's where i've been told there's most dissolved oxygen and plants seem to really like 68 degree water um i mean yeah like and i love that such a low tech uh way to go about it right like there's it's not a traditional chemical application i guess <laughs> and um uh yeah i've been i'm gonna have some videos coming out talking about um, uh, specifically uh, new insects that we find and other, other pests in, uh, in cannabis generally. I've been seeing a lot more people asking me questions. It's about that time of the year in North America with um, you know, various caterpillars are either coming out or they're going to pupate and you're having like uh, moths and things come out as well. Um, uh, and also I'm seeing a lot more people asking about stink bugs, and their little nymphal forms and their eggs that look a lot like uh, uh, their nymphs at least look a lot like uh, ladybugs and people will uh, confuse them a lot. And um, 
one other thing was uh, termites. I think I've mentioned a few other times before, but I'm seeing a lot more like termite activity associated with people in cannabis. I think somebody was in, uh, I think this was in like uh, Virginia, where I was getting videos about that recently um, from various people. So I've just gotten kind of... termites once in my cannabis. And were they attacking your plant? Well, what had happened was, so I had a whole bunch out in the wilderness and these two started yellowing out and I was bugging out a little, I'm like what the hell's going on? And I investigated, I didn't see any bugs on the outside. I didn't see anything funky. And then I started uh, squeezing the stem way at the bottom. It was all like spongy. And I was like, oh shit. So I don't mess around. I pulled those two out. I put them in plastic bags and I brought them home with me and I ripped them apart and, to see what was happening. And I found these little white bugs in there. And it took me about a week of, look, of Googling online. And I realized from a, I was actually a post from India that they were baby termites. And I didn't know this. They go into the live roots, crawl into the plant. And that's how they get into the, uh, into live plants and start eating the wood. So yeah, that's one thing. And I was going to ask Matthew, you said new bugs, new insects, but they're new to cannabis. There, are there, is there new bugs being created in evolutionary form today or no? I mean, like that's a it's kind of a complex question. I would say that uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, okay. <laughs> in a yeah. way, um, we're but, always uh, evolving at some, yeah, some exactly. capacity. <laughs> and then at the same time, we haven't discovered everything. So we might think this is, uh, yeah, a new, I should uh, probably be very specific with my words. I love to be right. Um, but uh, yeah, more like new, more like newer, probably even not even new to cannabis in some cases, just new, newly documented, at the very least to me, and right. also to other people. But um uh, you know, that's kind of the cool thing. Like when I made the, the Root Me the Bug video, um, other people came out and s talked about the Root Me the Bugs that they had come across after they'd seen the observational footage. So that was a really endearing uh, interaction. And I'm glad that people are able to like look at that and then kind of figure out what they're looking at. Kind of like why I want to like when people send me pictures and videos of these uh, insects, I want to put them out online so that people can have a really good reference for that. And uh, it's kind of like a little, um, like APB, a little alert bulletin. Brandon, I see you got your hand up. You can go ahead and jump in. Yeah, one of the insects that I'm seeing on cannabis that I hadn't seen before is cucumber beetles. They look really similar to ladybugs, but they're yellow and they're a little bit more elongated. Yeah, there's the first um, I've heard of it. There's a uh, uh, striped and spotted cucumber beetles. That's diabrotica. Um, is it diabrotica, diabrotica? I always forget. There's a few different uh, species that look very similar to each other. And uh, I've definitely seen, um, like a couple of months ago, somebody sent a video that I posted on my YouTube channel about uh, flea beetles. And I had seen flea beetles before. And uh, cucumber beetles are a type of a leaf beetle, and I think maybe also a flea beetle, which is a subset, um, those chrysomelids or whatever. And uh, yeah, those, a lot of those beetles are generalist herbivores. They eat a ton of different kinds of foliage. They eat like really uh, supple leaves. They eat very rough leaves. They're just really good at, at that in general. And um, their larvae, in fact, uh, the, I think I told the story before, the grasshopper active Buveri bassiana isolate that a lot of people are familiar with uh, was first isolated from, uh, or at least patented uh, uh, from a sample of a cucumber beetle larva, which is kind of interesting. Doc, I wanted to give you a chance to uh, address that question in the chat. And I think Brandon could maybe follow up. Um, he says, can anybody explain why high Phoebe VPD, vapor pressure deficit, is recommended for veg? High VPD means lower transpiration. This is what he's saying, which yeah. hurts calcium uptake. If trying to front load calcium, would you not want to run a lower VPD? And then Doc says high VPD equals high transpiration, which is my thought as well. So I'm agreeing with Doc. I want to pass it Yeah, on it's on just here. the opposite of the premise. Um, a high vapor pressure deficit, the way to think about that is that means there's a big deficit. That means the air wants a lot of vapor. It means it wants a lot of moisture. So the air will suck the moisture out. This is like a hot, dry day that you've, you know, dries out your skin. 
Um, that's because there's a deficit in the air. It doesn't have as much moisture as it could carry. So that's what vapor pressure deficit actually sort of means. So the higher the vapor pressure deficit, the more we sweat, the more plants will transpire. Um, and the recommendations are usually a little bit different than that too. So most recommendations start seedlings or clones with a very low vapor pressure deficit, um, move it up during um, vegetative growth to what is really a healthy vapor pressure deficit. And then often you'll get recommended to, to move it even higher than that for flowering. Um, the recommendations to move higher for flowering is usually more about maintaining the, a good climate to prevent bud rot and other pathogens. It's not necessarily because it, it's better for sort of photosynthesis or plant health or other things like that. It's that we're dropping the relative humidity to mitigate the risk of bud rot later on in the grow. And that means that the vapor pressure deficit is higher. I think that was well addressed. Brandon, do you want to add to that? So the way I understand it, as far as when you have a lower vapor VPD and you're able to uh, move calcium into the plant from solution easier. So it's easier to front load the calcium in veg to get the adequate amount that's going to help. So that way, because what like with the style that I do, I do that I front load calcium and, and nitrogen in veg. That way I can push, I can cut off the calcium amendment and then push potassium harder um, on the onset of um, the flower onset. So once they're actually, you start to see the onset of flower is when I change, not when you flip, not when the light cycle. Yeah, I, I would even think you could put it off later than that until the buds start developing to sort of a point where you have to worry about managing the humidity for them. Um, I, I'm interested about one of the things you said, but now I got to maybe smoke less during the show because I can't remember what it was that I was just going to ask you. I have a question that I could follow up with Matthew. Yeah, go ahead, maybe I'll come back to you. <laughs> Thanks. Day, Day Neutral Preserve says feeling. cucumber beetles and four-lined plant bug. So maybe you can address a little bit about the four-lined plant bug. I don't know if it's the same thing. And then Brent, Anderson follows it up, says cucumber beetles, they chow down and around, hand hunt, they're quick. So I just wanted to pass that uh, to you, Matthew, because I thought those were both pertinent comments to the topic we talked about a little earlier. But I don't, don't think we necessarily fully addressed it. And I wanted to follow up with the question of, do you have a uh, pest primer for either the four-lined plant bug or the cucumber beetles? I have, I think, some videos on some diaprotica species, some of those uh, cucumber beetles. But um, the four-line plant bug actually is not a beetle at all. It's a myrid. It's part of the myridae family. So it's like in the, if anyone here has dealt with like ligus, ligus bugs are really common. And maybe you've never heard the word ligus, but if I, if you were to like look it up, L-Y-G-U-S, ligus, um, they're really, really, really common. They're called tarnished plant bugs or just plant bugs. Um, you know, real creative name guys, but <laughs> Mark and I did one of those the other day with, uh, I think full duplex sent one to the group and he's like, I think that's a legus bug. And then you yes. I think, confirmed it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't actually, personally, I don't have a lot of experience with the four line plant bug myself a whole lot, uh, but I know what it is. And, um, uh, both the cucumber beetle and it are like a, a, they're like a yellow and black color. So I could see how people could maybe, um, uh, mistake them. And then there's also a lined, there's also not only a spotted cucumber beetle, but a lined cucumber beetle. And so uh, that could also lead to some of the issues, but essentially, um, uh, so, so to control them, there's a couple of different options. Of course, I always like to talk about various like botanical pesticides that people can use insecticides like, um, azadiractin, for example, and those are, are useful. Um, it's important to note, you know, just like uh, all other beetles, they have like chewing mouth parts, right? So they don't like suck the plant juices out like an aphid or like a four lined plant bug does. They like chew the leaves. So if you're not sure, sometimes like other flea beetles, you can see the damage. Like sometimes they skeletonize the leaves or they like leave little holes in the leaves or they'll like chew off like strips of the leaves. Um, but you won't see them because they will vacate the area. Uh, you know, kind of after eating sometimes. 
And I think that's a defense mechanism against like predation. Like they're just constantly kind of keeping me mobile, not all of them. Um, and if they find a little hidey place, then it might be a little bit uh, more welcoming for them. But if you have like an insecticidal agent that they have to, that, that gets onto the leaves, that's not, of course, noxious to yourself, um, then that's going to be problematic for them. Uh, I gave the Bouveri Bassiana story also because I like to use that very same uh, fungus to infect them. And I feel like that works pretty well too. The issue though, is that a lot of the flea beetles, whether it's like the black flea beetles that people get or, and these actually aren't flea beetles. Um, uh, uh, they are just uh, chrysomelids they're just leaf beetles. But anyways, regardless, these leaf beetles, they tend to like uh, kind of swarm. They tend to like kind of all come up at once and they tend to like eat in, in, in large masses. So you don't tend to deal with like one or two incidentally, you tend to deal with like a bunch of them, especially if like a large crop to deal with. Uh, and they can kind of get out of hand that way, especially in an outdoor setting. So if you're growing in an outdoor setting and it's a small amount, then if you like apply some sort of like a mesh, I guess mesh seems to be my favorite <laughs> defense mechanism, but it really is true if you can keep them from actually getting onto your leaves, then you kind of want to win the battle already. Um, Jose yeah. Canella says, should I be worried about termites around my ladies? Uh, you know, I think that the answer to that is sort of, yeah, because I am seeing a lot more people uh, getting disrupted by them. Also, like, surprisingly, I saw what I believe are, were fire ants, um, like kind of uh, stripping the cambium off of the... Uh, the 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 stalks of cannabis plants it was very bizarre i've heard um, of people complaining about fire ant infestations in their cannabis gardens uh, outdoor and it being very because they can actually attack the human gardener and cause uh, quite a lot of pain so and not only are I they had, hurting the plant but they can hurt the gardeners i had a client that uh, i still work with and they were having an issue with ants and i ended up using a trick that matt told me about and uh, it was i did that here at my house too you have to bait them with mm -hmm. the buvaria bassiana because they'll avoid it and they'll also like clean themselves real well and they won't let other workers back into the colony that are infected so you have to hide it in something that they can't recognize the the fungus it seems like but uh if you do it properly you can take out the whole entire colony have you found anything in particular that hides it well i know that people would put like beer bottles and stuff around their gardens and sometimes use those as like traps for ants and other pests and i don't know if that's a good idea or not but they'd put sticky traps around them and things like that yeah i like to use sugar personally that's what i was just about to say brown sugar probably works the best that's a good recommendation i had a good comment from the chat that i just it kind of uh, hits home for me with a lot of IPM topics, but it, not to go against what we were just talking about and like uh, ignoring or paying attention to a certain pest around you. But Akash Maharaj, I probably mispronounced it. I apologize. They said pigweed, flea beetles, and then they gave the technical name, which I'm not even going to try, decimate my fig trees in Trinidad, but seem to leave my cannabis alone for the most part. Now that's interesting to me because I've seen that on many occasions, not with just uh, insects, but also with like certain mildews. Like I've seen powdery mildew affect uh, a squash or roses and then not be the same type that'll affect the cannabis garden nearby it. But at the same time, it has also been the type that infected somebody's garden. I've seen it be both ways. So it's interesting that there can be something right next to your cannabis and have zero interest in it. But at the same time, I always kind of err on the side of caution and like, if it is close by my garden, maybe there's a chance. So let's not uh, be careless with it and try to at least identify it properly and, and keep some separation if you can. That's uh, Dysonica glabrata or glabrata or however you want to do the Latin. But um, yeah, that sounds about right. That definitely sounds like a flea beetle. Lots of them decimate the plants and then they just kind of ride out. So like they don't even stick around long enough to like, uh, be easy to like fix and, and, and kill. And there's going to be so many on other like weedy plants as the seasons change. Like, uh, you know, like it's a big thrips time right now because the weather's changing, the season's changing. Um, and uh, uh, we kind of had our hot summer, at least like, for example, here in, in Southern California, <laughs> it continues to be hot. But um, 
you know, a lot of those like weedier plants are getting less lush or, or dying or like, is there, or there's just senescing. And those, um, those kinds of insects are like looking for the next meal and uh, your crops are gonna be that next meal. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, so try to avoid that uh, as much as possible another... to contact. Good IPM question coming up here. So they say I from Jose Canela says, okay, I got a question. I have bugs around my veg tents, which are away from flower room, but I'm getting like household bugs and nothing so far that harms my plants. But I'd like to know if there's any oh and it cuts Anything off. Anything to keep random bugs away. There we go. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like it's there's just so many different kinds of bugs. I, I, I don't think that there's any one, one way, and that's kind of why they're so dang successful, is that, uh, you know, what attracts one will not attract another, or, or you know, what, what, rather what repels one will attract another, you know, whether it's like a volatile compound that a plant produces that's supposed to repel something, but it actually attracts another thing, you know, you kind of can't win in a lot of cases. Um, and a lot of the things that we've used in the past historically that are like broad spectrum, that are like toxins, um, they work really well and they have a long period of residence time, but, it's, but they also work well because they're just generally very poisonous for, to a lot of the physiologies of not just insects, but also mammals and, and people and fish and things like that. So um, it really helps to like have like a target. Sometimes you can look at like, um, uh, phylogeny a little bit so like uh, you know something that might maybe affects aphids in general maybe several species of aphids maybe several genera of aphids or beetles or something like that can be possible a little bit you can exploit some physiological weakness but generally by and large a species can be super diverse and um, uh, with regards to like residential insects you know cockroaches for example are super I mean, they're very successful at what they do because they have so many adaptations to like, you know, low food, low water. Um, they're hypervigilant uh, against like signals of like potential predation or disturbance. Um, so they're very hard to deal with, for example. Uh, but the thing that you can use is like the fact that they're like large, they have some sort of a, like a volume. So if you keep them out of your house, like that's probably the best thing you can do. If you can like caulk, um, or otherwise kind of shore up those ingress points if that's possible to do. Um, I think that can go a long way in keeping like residential bugs out uh, in general. But a lot of those aren't going to affect your cannabis plants, I would say. We got a question from Miranda Family Farms, and um, I'm not sure if they're aware of Bouveria bassiana, but I, I believe it falls under the category that they're referring to. They said, does anyone use a myco insecticide for any pests and i believe bavaria bassiana is one of those right myco insecticide absolutely yeah. so there's i think a, uh there's another one too it's the met bacteria or uh, the met uh fungus it's uh is that isaria fumo sorosia meta hazarium anaspolate that's another good one yeah there we go Metahesium and Bouveria, I think, are, I think actually Metahesium, Bouveria, and Isaria are yeah. rather close. I think they're all in the Cordyceps family, if I remember right. I don't think the Met is. I think, man, I have to look, I have to look, go through my notes and stuff, but I think that was a, a different one. I know the Isana and the Bouveria is definitely a Cordyceps. You are in the Cordyceps definitely family. right. They are in the Clavid. Clavipitaceae. Good job. Spartan, you look like you've got a nice frosty mug over there. Uh, what are you sipping on? And also we have a sip question. Uh, coincidentally, JMG420 says, so I wonder which kind of sips would be more practical or would you guys recommend just a simple fabric pot sitting on hydroton or say a tote with dirt directly in it? So like DIY sip or buy a sip. Uh, Spartan, oh. I'll pass that to you. Yeah, Spartan, man, so you can get fucking crazy with this shit. So, like with the um, with the Michigan Bros Grow Show, Abolish Farms has a uh, they call it um, the Frugal Force, and uh, the, 
they doing a sip method, um, like doing a whole trays at a time. So picture a four by four tray, you fill that with hydrogen, and then you can just set your fabric pots on it. And that's a sip container because it's sub irrigated. Um, those ones, you're going to have to be a little bit more careful with the top watering on transplant. You're going to have to top water those sips until those roots can grow down into the hydro hydrogen to access that water. So those ones you have to baby a little bit more. Also, the other downside to those is that your plants are tied in to a four by four space. They're not movable. Whereas these sub containers that both Jack and I use, they're on wheels. You can just be moved around. Um, but if you're using a big four by four scrog net, you're kind of locking your plants in anyway. So it's all situational on your space and your time on, on you know, on your, but yeah, you can, you can hundred percent do it yourself. Uh, multiple different ways there's probably hundreds of videos uh do it yourself sip containers online indoor outdoor raised bed sip containers i've seen all kinds of cool shit that's how i would build a raised bed personally is have some sort of like a hoogle is kind of like that with the dead logs or whatever at the bottom is like an aeration they're breaking up some sort of like i've seen people put rocks down there hydroton perlite whatever it needs to be to allow some basically aeration the roots to flow through and have some sort of water basin below it um I personally like buying them. It just makes things simple. Uh, if you're not handy, it's they're not super expensive. That's the other thing. And it's well built. Like it comes with the PVC pipe tube already. It comes with the grate at the bottom. So it keeps the soil up off the bottom. And the thing that I would prefer a uh, sip that I'm buying like a city picker or a earth box over just using a pot sitting on top of hydroton, um, the sides are actually waking up where the pot sitting on hydroton is basically just bottom fed. It's not really a sip. It's just bottom feeding. Um, where if you're doing the tote style, like I've seen abolished puts like the easy swap pots inside of a tote where it gets massive ones or even custom yeah. made to the size of the tote where there he's actually getting the full sip effect where it's wicking up the sides and the roots really get access to all that water. And uh, it just cycles better in my opinion. So if I was yeah, going to do actually... it, you know, I'd do that. I'm a big fan of plastic over, over, over fabric, fabric yeah. situations. No, I agree. And that's like one of the only times. And actually I've seen um, some people doing side by sides. Cause I think fabric got a ton of like, I hate to say it, but like, there's like big oil behind that. Like there's petroleum and like a lot of these, they're like, uh, it's a plastic product. Yeah. It feels like a fabric, but it's plastic. Um, but at the end of the day, like I saw some experienced gardeners that are like, you know, everybody's kind of switched to this in the last five or 10 years or whatever. I think the big, um, cultivation, you know, stores were pushing them for a long time, but when people started doing side by sides in their own pots, even though like sometimes they get that roots wrapped around the outside of the pot, those plants would be bigger and yielding better sometimes than the pots that, uh, even though the fabric pot it grew out to the end and it had like a solid root ball all the way through and it was never swirled, they had a bigger, healthier plant in the pots that were plastic so i'm curious on it, it might just come down to maintenance and what they're used to and uh cultivation preferences and things like that but with the just, sip plastic just, definitely works better yeah because i don't know how you guys feel but man it's like i didn't see any huge increase in in uh growth or anything with a plastic pot i did get some more roots i did get some more root growth i guess around the outsides a little bit but man try moving a a, a plant in a even a one gal fabric pot with one hand it's, it's it's not fucking happening without the plant tipping all over the place it's like i can grab twice as many plants with plastic than i can with fabric that's huge when, once you start upscaling you know what i mean it, it's fucking yeah it's just and yeah, no thank you on the, on the fabric pot plastic's pot. easier to clean too and reuse run after run where those fabric pots oh yeah they do, if they get salt, salt build up it's kind of a bitch to clean them you can run them through an industrial washer and sometimes that doesn't even get it all the way out so uh, plastic has its benefits and in some senses it can be more reusable um, because I know a lot of people throw out the fabric pots. They're like, Oh, I got my, they're only a, a buck a bag or something like that. So I got my value out of it that run and they just throw it out every run. So uh, I think sustainability is definitely always something we should consider, but performance is also, I mean, like you're talking about like the performance of the actual person having to move it, picking up two pots in a hand and not having them flop all over the place versus only being able to pick up one with one hand. You, you really, unless it's like, uh, the root ball is really, really well filled out in that one gallon pot. I don't feel comfortable picking it up by one hand. I always used to on each side if it's a fabric pot, because like you said, it kind of, it'll flop. And then the plant and a bunch of the medium will be on the floor and you've got a mess on your hands that you don't necessarily want. So I definitely think we uh, hit that sip question well and uh, Miranda family farms we already addressed. So I'm going to go look over the chat and see if uh, anybody else on the panel has some thoughts.
I have no thoughts. That was usually good for one. He's probably still uh, tapping his mute button on that new screen over there. Now I'm just. No, I'm thoughtless too. Uh, I never did sips. I'm I'm thinking about it though because it just makes everything a little easier. You don't have to sweat the. Dude, you don't on. have to worry about it get fully dried just out. Just right. Get one. There you go. I'm gonna do it. I will. It's I like the idea from like a, um, like a like a water management like a low water application perspective i don't know if that's valid but i imagine that like instead of like uh you know using sprinklers and things like water top wise that's like really wasteful a lot of it gets evaporated right but if you're applying it underneath subterraneanly then like you know there's some obvious benefits yeah there's no runoff in a in a so you're not getting any runoff right spartan no it's fully contained and the other beauty of that is in my tent versus even like uh, three pots of soil I have my RH is lower, even though I have more soil in the sip and more water in the system because it's contained within a plastic cover. The whole top is covered. The whole sides are covered where before I had a fabric or like a rain science grow bag is what it was called. But the water, you could see it would basically run right through and out the outside. So that can evaporate out into the atmosphere in the tent. So you have more RH that you're having to exhaust. That's not staying within the roots uh, where your plants have access to it. I do want to stress that we one thing we haven't brought up in the sips is I'm almost exclusively talking about inorganics. If you start, in my experience, if you start trying to run synthetic feed through a sip container, you're going to get this gigantic salt buildup in the top layer of your soil where it stays dry. And if you ever make the mistake of top watering in, in that system, you're going to nuke your roots because all those salts are going to dissolve into the water and just completely burn the fuck out of your roots. So that's like a real common mistake. People with like um, systems like auto pots, that's a SIP system. Um, they'll get auto pots going in and then run synthetic nutrient through it. And then they want to flush at the end of their, at their end of their cycle. Well, you, they don't realize they have like, who knows, how much, you know, PPMs of dry nutrients sitting at the top of that. And as soon as they hit that top to try to flush through that, it's game over. Yeah. I, I don't want to yeah, call them out. I totally out. agree with that, Spartan. I, I think that these are awesome ideas for, for growing organically or going for it with amended media. Um, but yeah, it's not for mixing nutrients in the water. I think uh, Urban Remo, who is a Canadian grower, has had a ton of success with auto pots and has Remo nutrients. So a lot of people watched his YouTube videos, said, oh, he uses auto pots. I'll use auto pots. He uses Remo nutrients. I'll use Remo nutrients. And then they followed that system. And um, I like Remo a lot. He's very entertaining. And he's taught a lot of people how to grow and got people into cannabis, which I respect the shit out of that. And uh, big ups to him. But I think if you, his videos are really short and sweet and to the point and kind of more like, look at the buds, like, look at the lights, like here's, he's promoting like how well his things are doing, but it's not as much like, this is how you grow. And he has those videos, but they're probably not getting as many views or as much attention. So I think a lot of people are drawn in to like the, Oh, look at the system. It, Autopot, even within the name, it makes you sort of think it's going to like do most of the work for you. And you're just going to kind of have an easier job. So sometimes people can get, uh, lackadaisical and just think that it's all going to run smoothly and go perfectly like they're seeing and uh, expect those same results. But it's important to know, like Spartan saying, you don't want to allow a bunch of EC to build up in that top dry area and then go in top water and, and basically get your EC way, way higher than you want it to be in the root zone. Just be prepared for larger plants than what you, you may expect because the way that the, I don't know what it is. I, I don't have the, the technical knowledge but it's a, this is my understanding. This is how I understand it, okay? This is how the plants told me, right? So it's almost as like they can't sense that they're in a small pot because they have their roots like dangling into the water or something. And they just fucking get big if you let them. So um, be prepared for that. If, if it's something you think you're going to stick in the veg and just leave in the corner and forget about, don't do that. It's going to get big as fuck on you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love your plant whisperer. I, I put a little, I, another idea there. I agree that when plants have access to both water and air at the same time, that, that you, I mean, that's one of the, the benefits that we get from doing high frequency fertigation and cocoa. Um, 
Yeah, they they keep growing. They're not running into some of the same obstacles that you're going to get with a, a typical top fed container soil sort of grow. So it's it, I was going to say it reminds me of when I grew in cocoa. It's so similar. Yeah. They both grow so fast. It's almost problematic if you start your veg too soon. Like I pop seeds each run. So yeah. if I was a little overzealous and I pop something early and it's dialed in. Your plants are just growing so vigorous that like you're going to run out of space or like grow into your light. Like that's my problem with Tao's plant right now. Uh, the Amy Aces. It, it was so vigorous in the sip. I never grew it before. So I was like, okay, maybe it'll double. It tripled and then some after the stretch. It was just super healthy and vigorous. I wanted to keep growing and I was bending it over and it's just like growing up and up and up and out and it filled out the whole entire space. So uh, sometimes you just get those super happy, healthy plants. And this I time I, was just I, I don't want to go past what Spartan just said because when he was talking about, you know, this is what the plants told me. I mean, I was imagining the conversation that Spartan was having and I, great I could sort of hear the plant telling him that. I mean, I can imagine my plants telling, telling me that similar <laughs> message. So I really enjoyed that. <laughs> hey, I want to run over and this actually kind of ties into what we're, what the hell was that? Ties into um, what we're talking about too, is I think the, the SIPS method kind of takes away the guesswork on water frequency. Like when should I water? It makes it real, real easy. So it's hard to mess that up, which was going to give you a better plant too in the end. And then what reminded me of this was smart poker in chat was brought up. They say I'm in a half gallon plastic right now with extra holes in 30% perlite, perlite still insufficient for me. They stay too wet and stagnant. I need to do better. See, when I see something like that, I think you're tackling it wrong as far as putting extra holes in, in I don't know if 30% perlite is more than what you normally do. We don't run perlite at all at work, but I mean, it's up to you on that. But what I would encourage you to do is, is do water management. So like the volume of water that you're putting through might be too much for the root ball that you have. Maybe you've just transplanted and you hit it with too much water and it's taking too long to dry out, for example. Um, I would really encourage your, your, if you, if you feel like the, they're too wet for too long, don't water them as much, either reduce the amount of waterings during the day or reduce the volume of that watering before you start drilling holes and stuff like that. And you can also try and harness your psychic powers like this guy, because this is what I was picturing when Spartan was talking about, uh, you know, talking to his plant and, uh, listening that is how I talk to my plants. I close my eyes and everything. Honestly, I think uh, sometimes they, they can communicate to you, even though it's not like they're speaking. They're usually showing us visually. Or, uh, Do you touch them when you're talking to them, Spartan? No. Do you, like, you, you no. kind of like hold them gently? And it's like, no. Sometimes I have to like touch the stalk of like a plant. Just, you yeah, know. I, don't want, I want to eliminate any outside influence. So I stand in the middle of the room and close my eyes and I can sense where it's coming from. I can sense direction from them talking to me. I'm not even joking. I'm fucking serious here. No, I, I totally kids. feel it. I know. I'm not, I'm not even making fun of you either. I am totally identifying with you right now. Like, I don't have children, but I've woken up in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, I had a, a dad tell me, like, he woke up in the middle of the night when his kid was crawling out of the crib and, like, was about to fall out. And he, like, woke up dead sleep and caught the kid before he hit the floor. And I think I had that kind of moment once where my plant was about to fucking die. And, like, two in the morning, I wake up and I'm like, I need to fucking water my plant. And I run over and it, sure enough, it was like drooping and looked like it was on its last fucking leg. And I don't know what that is, but maybe it's like some subliminal clock in my head. That's like, Hey, you should have watered before you went to bed. And it like woke me up and realized, but I don't the know. One for a, me, the, that happens the most often is it helps me in scouting. Like, it'll be like insane. Like I've got a plant with four leaves on it with pick your bug thrip damage. You know what I mean? You're not going to see that shit day in, day out. I mean, unless you're like super, but I can walk into a room getting ready to water a plant or something and then get this feeling, look around behind me and there's a fucking plant that's fucking like, and I, there's just one leaf that catches my eyes for no reason. And it's got fucking trip damage on it or something. And it's like, I don't know how many times that saved my ass. There's got extra big... insectary perception. <laughs> <laughs> and a good reminder to Crop Scout for anybody out there, uh, daily reminder to go and check your garden for pests and bugs and damage because it might be you catch it early and you can literally save your entire crop with yeah. a prompt uh, response. 
tr- probably checking out a Zenthanol video on YouTube or two. Because, <laughs> it doesn't uh, work for me anywhere something. else. It doesn't work at work. <laughs> it doesn't work in other people's gardens. Only in my own home gardens. Only place. That's because you're 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 tuned to it. You know, yeah. it's like uh, you spend enough time and like. I've known and, them since uh, they were babies. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You gave them life. That's the crazy thing. Like we True. actually brought them into this world. We are the person that provided the water that, you know, made the seed sprout. So in a sense, it is like we're responsible for that life. And uh, I don't know, there's a connection. I think many there's gardeners a, have that feeling. There's a connection and there's a real sense of nurturing there yeah. involved. I mean, like you care about your plants in a certain way because you brought them into the, the world like that. And I totally believe that you could be dialed in and, and sort of talking to your plants about how they feel about their roots and how freeing the new sip soil containers make them feel. I, 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 I love that conversation Spartan had. I, <laughs> I, I miss having plants to talk to. I got to get my plants growing here really quickly. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm just jealous. I think more than anything else at this point. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, I should beautiful. get going though. I got I got guests here, and um, I'm just kind of like sitting back, chilling, enjoying the conversation. I hope you guys have a great rest of the show. But I should uh, I should tend to my hosting duties here. <laughs> we'll let the night, uh, people know where they can find you, and if there's anything new and exciting coming up on uh, Cocoa for Cannabis. Absolutely, guys. Um, Come and find me at CocoForCannabis.com. Check out my YouTube channel, Dr. MJ Coco. Um, I'll have another video out this week. I'm still waiting to start my grow. As soon as I start my grow, I'm going to do uh, a series of uh, videos on that as well. Um, you can check me out on Instagram. Um, and yeah, at Coco for Cannabis, we um, have some giveaways going on. Um, it's not too late yet to, to sign up for the Plant Training Go Challenge, which is going on right now. Um, and of course, check out our live chat room, all you chatters that love chatting. Um, girl, love everybody. I am happy to be back. Happy to see all my, my friends in chat and here on the panel. Hope you guys have a great rest of the show. Grow or love. Have, have a great night. night, Doc. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for joining, Doc, and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much for joining us again. Hey, Jack, I wanted to jump in and just answer. There's one more. I love the sip stuff. I can't. No, uh, dude, it's great. Sell. That's what this episode's focused on. Set, hold on. I'm going to mess this up. Sell. I'm sorry, Sell. This, this last name is tough for me. Bl- Blendenburg. Blendenburg. Anyways, it says, do you ever top water in organic inputs? This is a good question. Like teas or recharge? And yeah, if there's ever an input that I want to add for whatever reason, maybe I'm addressing a, a deficiency or I'm trying to you know, front load something, something like that. Um, yes, I'll do a top dress and I water that in through the top. And in fact, I probably water through traditionally, like through the top, like you would normally water a plant. 80% of the time, maybe 20% of the time, do I actually use the little feed tube? I'm only using that for a looking glass. Basically, I'm looking through that to see if it needs water. But when I do need, when, if I feel it needs water, I'll water it through the top, just like, you know, when it rains, it waters through the, the the earth i don't water through the tube um the real big thing with that tube why i want it there is, is to bring gas exchange bring that oxygen down into the root zone and uh and for me to see into the res and, and it's not really using it as a i'm not really using it as a feed tube i'm usually always walk top watering I've, uh, that's why i don't use the that's why i don't use the shower curtains or, or the shower caps like what cap. you got jack you could uh, peel it back and like top dress something and then water through it if you wanted to, but it would be difficult to be honest. I um, will add occasionally some uh, gypsum to my water because it's micronized and it's water soluble, uh, just small amounts. And then I'll also add microbes pretty much are the two. Oh, the other thing is uh, Brennan's got the uh, amino N plus, which I'll add to the reservoir on occasion, but I just threw the Zoom link into the YouTube and we've got a YouTube chatter who I recognize the name of. So Scroggy Mick Scroggington IV or the fourth, I think, is going to be joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and hit admit uh, and they'll be within the oh, welcome, Scroggy. panel soon. Just Scroggy is connecting, YouTube. so they YouTube. probably yeah. can't hear us yet. We okay. know it. Plus. If you have YouTube going, please yeah. mute it. Before you come oh, on. yeah, yeah. If you're going to join the show like Scroggy is right now. Uh, mute the YouTube. It looks like he jumped out. He's welcome to jump back in. That's uh, my bad. I kind of there's like about a 30 second delay, roughly. 
uh, from the YouTube to the actual Zoom. So muting the Zoom or the YouTube will allow you to hear us through Zoom um, while you still can maybe participate on the show. If you have like a laptop, pull it up on there. But if you're just on your phone, uh, you'll probably just be best to just turn off the YouTube and uh, you're welcome to rejoin us. I see Smiley's Garden, Kate Armstrong, uh, Simon Arden, C-Dub from NorCal, Shredder0911, Sergeant Bone, Teddy Sidesman, What About Bob, and Scroggy Mick Scroggington. Sorry, didn't know it was live. <laughs> yeah, Scroggy, it's live, dude. This is uh, the real thing, the real deal. So if you if you want to join us, you are welcome to join. I'd love to just hear what's going on in your garden. What are you growing? And if you have any questions, uh, now's your time to ask. You got the panel, and uh, we'd love to... I love when I was on or listening to podcasts, whether it was like the Joe Rogan experience or a cannabis podcast, a lot of the time I'd be like, oh man, I wish I could jump in there, like share my two cents. And then eventually like having access, I think this is a nice way to hopefully pull some of these people into the community. Maybe they start their own show or maybe they become a regular panel member if they uh, seem to be a good person. This is a, I always just like to meet the people. Think of how many people, how many people came originally from this show. And, and that spurned how many other shows after, you know, if you sit there and think about it, man, it's pretty crazy, man. It really is. And I wish I could, I would like to shout out the person, but they don't like to be named on the show. Every, most people know who they are, uh, but the cheap home grow podcast creator who brought us all here, it was not Jack Greenstock. I'll tell you that. And if you've been around long enough, you know who I'm talking about. So big ups to him. Hope he's doing well. Uh, last I heard from him, he is, it's just, he took a step away from the cannabis space and respectfully, I want to, uh, if you want some anonymity and some time away and maybe he'll come back someday maybe not, but we're keeping the show on the road in uh, the meantime, and just can't be more thankful for all the episodes that he did back when that kind of brought us together, individual interviews. And then ultimately, uh, this podcast growing with my fellow growers, we're here 131 episodes. That's crazy. Two plus years and still running. It's been a uh, quite the ride and no plans on stopping anytime soon. I can't believe it. So, uh, such, such a shy chat. No one wants to jump in. Well, uh, I shout out to our buddy, Steve, to our buddy, Steve in chat was just asking, uh, to talk. He said, we should talk to Matt about mosaic. I don't know if he's specifically talking about tobacco mosaic or what mosaic. There's a lot of kinds of mosaic viruses, but I'm positive. He's talking about tobacco mosaic. Okay. So um, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we should talk about it. Uh, apparently, there are people who have um, taken like Eliza, not Eliza. Um, they've taken like uh, basically they've used kits to detect um, poor tobacco mosaic virus in uh, in plants, and they have actually uh, gotten positive readings, but. Um, I would be curious to know more about that kind of thing. What's um, the transmission? Well, how, how is it transmitted? Well, well, typically, well, so, so, and I've said it before that although I haven't seen really empirical sources talk about uh, tobacco mosaic virus and cannabis very much, there are tons of, um, there, are, there are several groups that uh, test for it in cannabis and state that they have found it in cannabis. So it seems like there is, um, uh, some some uh, veracity to that claim, and there's really old study like from a heart like there's a Hardowitz uh, research report that uh, tested a bunch of different um, uh, viruses on on cannabis, but it was done like many decades ago, and um, honestly, everything from the names of certain viruses to um, they're like taxonomic. Uh, uh, the viruses duplicate and multiply and mutate like so fucking fast. 20 years ago isn't really going to help us is it to some degree it does still but you're right it's kind of well not also the way that we the methods we use to like detect them are a lot different oh, so yeah. uh, it'd be kind of like and you know like you say like sometimes we get different strains that come out and um also we come to find out that like two things that we thought that we considered a different species maybe are, are is more better conceived as a single species and a strain of the other one you know that kind of stuff happens but um on the Future Campus Project, I talked about a couple of different viruses that were in a, a German paper. Um, and basically, like potato, one that I'm familiar with uh, from other plants is called potato virus Y um, and uh, cucumber mosaic virus. And uh, I think those also tested for positive, but that was in, uh, I think the paper was in 1997. 
And uh, I could send it to anyone who'd be curious to find out. But essentially, um, I've said in the past that tobacco mosaic virus wouldn't surprise me because it has such a massive host range already for plants. Um, like 300 plus plants are uh, known hosts of tobacco mosaic virus. And tobacco mosaic right. virus is very, very um, stable outside of its host. A lot of viruses aren't, but tobacco mosaic virus really is. It can, it can stay in soil for uh, kind of a long time if the conditions are right. So if it was something that like, even if you suspected, if you suspected a plant had tobacco mosaic virus, would you remove that from the rest of the population because it could be transmitted just by touching leaf to leaf? Or is it going to be contained in the soil and you're not really too worried about it? No, like you can, uh, you can get in the soil and then infect the plant that way, or it gets kicked. Or what happens sometimes is like maybe the so like it gets kicked up and the soil particles and stuff get onto the plant, and it's a uh, it's called it's therm it's what's called thermostable. Um, so it it's just kind of like it's able to like be resilient in the face of like some environmental uh, challenges that a lot of viruses maybe can't outside of the, uh, can't survive outside the host for very long in. Uh, most plant viruses, maybe not most, but I, I think it is actually most are um, vectored by insects in some way, shape, or form. And uh, aphids account for like way more than half of that uh, by themselves. Uh, so they're really competent. They're really good uh, vectors. I actually just posted about uh, the silverleaf whitefly and scary, scary research about it that's already been uh, published for several years is that uh, certain viruses can actually replicate in the nuclei, in the cells oh of the God. silverleaf whitefly, yeah, and bind to the, um, uh, they, can, they can bind to like saliva glands and like other oh, sort of gut lumen, so they can like stay on the, on the insect. And in some cases, even there seems to be some evidence that they can also be passed vertically into the oocytes that become the eggs and if that's true if that's actually a, a valid you know transmission pathway uh then that's pretty amazing because the silver leaf white fly can vector 400 plus viruses documented and a lot of those viruses are really well known uh with a broad host range and when they did experiments <laughs> uh, people are going to maybe find this really interesting because Essentially, it was what we what we might call gain of function because the uh, the the they took a virus that's normally not uh, um, vectored by the white fly, and they switched the gene. There's a special like uh, recognized a recognition gene or something on the sh on the capsid, and they switched it, uh, and so and that allowed the virus that's normally not transmitted to be transmitted by the white fly. And so, and why the, the fuck would they even do that? Well, the great fear is because viruses replicate so well that um, it might only be a matter of time before certain viruses. Now I'm speculating here, because certain closely related viruses could also certain viruses like creamy viruses, um, they have uh, bipartite genomes. And so they can, they can pseudo combine and they can recombine with others that are closely related. And um, sometimes you even get two viruses getting into one cell and then the, the genetic material intermixes that way. Um, so it's, it's, I, think, I think it's, it's a valid concern to consider ourselves That's insanity about. to me because usually in nature you would have competition there, but instead they just fucking work together and mix. Well, it's, um, I mean, there's not like a whole lot of intent to it. Um, I think it just happens to be the case that the, the, the DNA or the RNA or whatever, um, depending on what we're talking about, like it's in there and is uh, transcribed and um, it kind of, I guess you could say it's kind of like interference, but it, uh, it hybridizes. Now this isn't super common as far as I understand it to be the case, but it is something that does happen in some plant viruses more than others. And um, I think that also like for the, there's a, like the B. Kulita virus is a Kurto virus and it's part of the, um, Gosh, is I'm that kidding. horizontal gene transfer, Matthew? Uh, yeah, you could think of it like that. Okay, yeah. I feel like it kind of breaks down when we talk about viruses because I think all of their trend, I think all of their uh, transmission is kind of both. 
right? Uh, in, in some way. Um, there's even, uh, there's a really there's a great, for those who watch uh, or don't watch uh, Kurtzugats or whatever it's called on YouTube, uh, it's a really popular channel that talks about a lot of different like, you know, scientific disciplines. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice little animated presentation format. And uh, they just recently made a, a, a video about various kinds of viruses. And they talked about some really cool ones. Like there are even some viruses that um, they described as like being predatory or parasitic of other viruses. But really, it's kind of like what I'm describing here, where like the virus will kind of get into the cell at the same time as the quote unquote host virus. And then it will uh, either integrate itself into the genome, like maybe like a retrovirus into the organism, or it will integrate itself into the genome of the host virus and like kill it, essentially parasitizing it sort of, or in some way it like hi hijacks the genetic replication ability or something like this. Um, it's very complicated. <laughs> I don't understand it fully myself. Matthew, um, um, as far as endophytes in there and fucking switching what those fucking viruses do. <laughs> apparently, apparently the parasite virus can be useful for the host because it gets in there and kind of interferes. That's um, awesome. Can you imagine know, right? throwing yeah. in parasites to combat a virus? That's, um, that's awesome. That's like using predator mites. I know, totally. Um, I think that's a really cool idea, personally. Uh, you know, I was just describing about how, um, you know, ecologically speaking, we think of plant viruses as like, you know, bad, obviously, they're typically, typically, they're lethal to their host, sometimes they're beneficial, but uh, from the individual level, but consider, like, the idea that, like, in the case of, like, B. curly top virus, or Les sclerosis virus, both of which infect cannabis, it can be asymptomatic in many plants, and symptomatic in something like cannabis. Now, if there's an insect that's going around vectoring it, and it vectors it to one plant, and it's asymptomatic in that plant, then that plant's totally fine, no problem. Uh, but if it kills a bunch of plants around it that are susceptible and they die, well, that's kind of beneficial for the competing plant, right? So in a way, you could consider that virus to be like a biocontrol agent. It yeah, can be like, considered like a beneficial mutualist to those just uh, plants agent. that don't react to it. Just an agent of natural selection. I guess so. We've got a uh, potent ponix is joining us here in just a second. I was curious, um, Matthew, is TMV, has it not been documented in cannabis yet? Because I know Kyle sent off a clone and one of the tests that they ran was for, uh, it was like the whole range of TMV and uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Tobobo viruses. Tobomo, Tobomo viruses. Yeah. So he got his plant tested for that and it came back negative. But is there any cases where they've documented positive for that in cannabis that, that we know of? Yeah. yeah, that's what I was talking about. I think um, Steve has some uh, a really good example of that. I think that's what I was trying to articulate before. Sorry if that was it was like confusing. But um, yeah, essentially, there are various groups or ver there are various uh, places that sequence for this sort of thing. And um, they have they, they do. That is one of the things that they specifically look for. But when I say that it hasn't been empirically documented, I mean something very specific. Um, uh, well, actually, it has been in some cases in the older research, but I'm curious to know kind of a more updated understanding of what and how and to what frequency. And that kind of thing is really, um, you know, a private entity doesn't have the scope necessarily or is even concerned with that information, though they probably should be. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know that I want to see something very specific and um, I think that will demystify the situation a little bit better. I'm actually surprised it hasn't already happened. And if it has, then I'm just not aware of that research. Yeah, we will see. I want to give a welcome to Steve from Potent Ponics. Welcome back. Hey, how's it going? Good to have you. Any thoughts on the TMV in cannabis? Have you seen or heard of anything uh, personally? Yeah, tell oh, yeah. Your welcome, story. Steve. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up, Brandon? All kinds of cool people on here now. What's going on? <laughs> we got a whole panel of cool people now. We fucking made it. <laughs> What's up, Steve? And the American one, too. All kinds of cool people. Um, yeah, so actually, uh, uh, there's actually a paper that Israel... Oh, hold on. Sorry about the dogs in the back. 
Okay, I think they're done. Um, uh, the hemp streak virus, hemp mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus, alfalfa mosaic virus, Arabis mo mosaic virus, and tobacco mosaic virus have been confirmed, at least according to uh, that one Israeli paper that's often cited. Uh, I think Matt knows the one I'm talking about. Is that the Hardowitz study I was talking about? Uh, I can never remember the name of the papers, I think. So let me see if I can pull it up real quick. It's funny, you this. probably did mention it, Matthew, but I was like reading comments and uh, getting back to people in chat and sometimes stuff, even though I'm listening, like or trying my best, it goes uh, over my head while I'm listening live and uh, I'll catch it on the playback and be like, oh, I asked a question that he just answered 10 minutes ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I didn't even bring up the name, like, uh, but I think it was like in, I want to say it was like in 1967 or something like that. So it was, it was quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, Oh, but the German paper I was talking about, um, they looked at several different viruses, uh, like cucumber mosaic virus, and I think also Arabis mosaic virus. And um, I could probably bring it up right here for everyone. Sounds good. In the meantime, I'll read a question that I think uh, Spartan, I usually defer to you, or I, I can't refer to one of the comments I remember you saying about having you like your worm bin separate than your pots or your earth boxes because they kind of both prefer different conditions, which I've kind of always remembered and will pair it to people that are trying to run a worm bin and have, uh, you know, a living soil pot type system. But the bright side grower asks at Sheep Home Grow, how do you feel about living? How do you feel about worms in living soil pots? I ask because my pots have acquired six inches of worm castings, which I assume isn't great to start seeds in. Actually, it's not terrible. That's okay. Yeah, it's not terrible for seeds. And um, the reason I don't like worm, I don't like adding worms to my, to my pots. There's worms in my pots, but I didn't, you know, I didn't try, I didn't go out and buy them and try to put them in there. They just came in, you know, they were in part of my castings because I don't have a fine enough screen to, to screen out the cocoons but the great thing about worms is they're self-regulating so if you just ignore them they'll fucking do their thing and uh, they won't get out of control if they run out of food stuff they'll just fucking self-regulate and not reproduce their cocoons i'm not exactly sure uh coot was telling me one time that like cocoons will stay act or like dormant in the soil until the conditions are right for a worm and then they'll come out so it's really crazy it's it's really hands off with them so I wouldn't be alarmed if I saw it. It's kind of a good thing to, but to really have a good, healthy population of worms and to, like, if you were breeding worms or you wanted to run an active worm bin that was processing a lot of waste, the conditions would be way too moist that for what you'd want to be growing a plant in. So um, that's I why I don't really it, like to cultivate worms in my pots. I think it depends on how big the soil load to soil container is. If you got a huge bed, There'll be spots maybe where the worms could survive because like this living yeah. soil indoors that people have the worms living in it. If it's big enough, there'll be areas where the worms could be happy and your plants roots can be happy. I think, you know, I never did a living soil with worms in it, but I keep mine separate. And uh, I found I only seen uh, only found worms in like two times in my containers from using my uh, earthworm castings. And as far as starting seeds, a lot of times I'll throw in, uh, seeds will just pop out of my uh, earthworm castings all the time. But I think it might uh, depend on timing. If they're, if they're you know, um, broken down enough and the seeds are, it'll be happy for the seeds to pop then, that's one thing. But if it's not broken down enough, they probably won't, they won't be happy with seed. You know what I'm saying? Here's the study that uh, Steve just sent us. So I wanted to give it some uh, airtime so that people could check out the abstract there, the title up top, uh, some of the scientists who conducted the research. This is a. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the Les Clarissus virus report uh, yeah. I, I often the, talk about. In the introduction section, it actually mentions the other viruses that have been confirmed uh, the mosaic uh, viruses, the alfalfa, Arabis, and all that. And then it links to that paper uh, with the citing for each one. Uh, it's mostly from um, the Mc, uh, McPortland. Uh, anyways, it's called uh, Hemp Diseases and Pest Management and Biological Controls. Yeah, effects. I think it is the heart of Yeah, because see, none of these are tobacco mosaic virus, right? 
No, they're all different. And that, that's my point is, is that most, I think the reason why a lot of people aren't getting confirmed tobacco mosaic viruses is because most of them aren't tobacco mosaic. They're other mosaics. Cucumber. But mosaic mosaic like, only describes like a visual, like a symptom. Yeah. They can be very exactly. disparately related. Well, it's like septoria, right? Mo both mosaic virus and septoria have hundreds, if not thousands of different species uh, across the different ones. And they can express slightly differently, but they all have a similar patterning, you know, same kind of thing. Uh, yeah, but I'm not so sure that um, like, uh, could you go down, Jack? I'm not sure that um, hemp streak virus is a Tobama virus, for example, or hemp, hemp mosaic virus. I'm not sure the phylogeny of. I think alfalfa mosaic virus might be. I just don't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately. I do agree, though, with Steve that people are probably misinterpreting a lot of uh, other mosaic viruses and thinking it's tobacco mosaic virus. Oh, that's, and that's what why you we're mean. not seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people that think makes more, yeah. they're seeing lots of like. They they think it's tobacco mosaic virus. They test for it. It comes back negative, and then they're like, "Well, it's not mosaic virus." Well, yeah, it's not tobacco mosaic, but it's gonna. It could be cassava or alfalfa or cucumber or something else. That's why it tested negative. That's my point. Oh yeah, I totally agree with that completely. Um, and then that's even going. Yeah, that's even not even touching the fact that like some viruses won't have symptoms sometime, or you can get have multiple pathogens, not just viruses, come together and uh, you know, this has mystified plant viral virologists a lot in the past where, uh, they would have two totally, you know, two viruses that have different symptoms that come together. And then the other, the resulting isn't like a perfect mesh of the two. It's like a very, very different thing, uh, symptomatically. Um, you know, so people think that's actually a dip it's like in, that, in those cases, people thought, oh, that must be a different pathogen altogether, but really it was just two of them in the same plant. So that's what I totally agree with that viral load expression in a specific portion of the plant, not the rest of the plant. And then being like, well, if it was mosaic, it would go across the whole plant. Not necessarily. Um, oh yeah. Uh, but viral load is based on stress, right? So if the plant's having problems with just that one part of the plant, it might express and, and over accumulate the viral load in that area. So you can absolutely have a portion of a plant or even a single leaf, express a viroid that's otherwise being suppressed by the plant's immune system that's why you can have quite a bit of different expression uh, across it is a lot of i think people don't quite understand how a viral and how i like to express this to people is like look and i'm going to use a real world example like uh you could have you know uh, uh hiv right and and be on antivirals and be healthy and, and eat right and, and, you know, smoke cannabis and all that stuff and be perfectly healthy and no one would know. Right. But if you just stop taking those antivirals and you ain't taking good care of yourself and maybe you get into too much recreational drugs on top of that or something, you're going to definitely visually look like you have something wrong with you after a while. Right. Cause that viral load is going to go up. Plants are the same way. Mosaic virus works the same way. Um, so you can absolutely uh, have, you know, a healthy plant and a sick plant next to each other. And one of them is more stressed out. So the viral load is past that threshold to get that viral load to just explode uh, and, and cause that plant to express even within the same, you know, um, uh, seed batch, you know, have one that shows and one that doesn't, even though they Absolutely. both have it. I yeah, think um, lighting that's what, Sorry, that's why when, pe when people do um, virulence tests, like we were talking last week about uh, powdery mildew, and, um, you know, when people do tests, when they do inoculation tests, uh, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than just taking the mildew and spreading it on the other plant, uh, you know, because they have to control for like, they have to make sure that the powdery mildew isn't, uh, you know, what if you happen to get a one in a hundred or a one in a thousand or a one in a hundred thousand chance of a hypovirulent powdery mildew strain, right? Or, or maybe this particular strain or this particular like colony uh, you know, it just doesn't have the chops or whatever, essentially, that maybe a different strain of the same species does. And, and that kind of stuff happens all the time. Um, and, and I totally agree. Like that's, that's, it's the virulence of the pathogen and the sort of immune response setup uh, innately uh, of the plant, but also like how you as a cultivator are like augmenting that. So it's kind of tripartite in that way. I have the um, the German paper. I think even some of these viruses are also mentioned. If uh, Jack, you want to uh, transfer me some control, 
I will do that right now. And we've got a question that uh, Steve just forwarded. It's a question from chat. What are the modes of transmission uh, at Potent Ponics and at Cheap Home Grow? I, I mean, so generally with plants, um, I mean, there's, there's horizontal and there's vertical transmission, if that's what we're talking about. Usually that's uh, mechanical. So uh, that can be mechanical, um, like with hot blade and viroid. Uh, so that's when like the, something that carries some, some sort of fomite is responsible for transferring like equipment or even like just like brushing the, uh, the veriferous plants together, you know? <laughs> Uh, that it like leaf on leaf for layman leaf out there. Leaf. If you have a plant yeah. that touches a plant next to it, the unhealthy plant can touch the plant next to it and transfer its hoplite and viroid from its leaf to the leaf of the next plant. Or you can cut into the tissue, get all of that plant juice with the viroid on it, and then you uh, sort of put it into the other plant when you cut the next plant. This is actually a more crude version of how aphids and other things can transmit uh, plant viruses. If you want a really good example, a, a real world example, check out uh, Medicropper. He had a uh, hoplite and viroid up at his commercial growth facility in Oregon, and he's been battling it for like the last two years. And you could see the healthy plants versus the unhealthy plants and like a branch that's like sick versus like uh, Steve was talking about earlier. Sometimes the plant is healthy enough to like fight it off most of the plant, but just one branch is super unhealthy and like wimpy and you can touch it with your hand and it'll completely fall off the plant. So uh, it's interesting to see, but uh, I wanted to let Matthew share your source now that I'm seeing it's just individual speaker view. So uh, I don't know if you want to share screen or some resource. Oh, it didn't give me the option. Oh, okay. I made you host. So I think maybe if you click down, uh, maybe are you still the host? Oh, actually, I don't, maybe I. At the bottom middle, oh, it should say share screen. I do have the ability screen. to do that. Yeah, sorry. Okay. okay. All right. You guys can see this? Yes, I can. Okay. Oh, it says Zer virus. Sur virusum phalangit von Hampsorten, or on the virus susceptibilities of hemp types or hemp sorts, or hemp in this case varieties. Um, it says mainly in German, and my German is um, rusty. But um, here we can see these various viruses. So we have alfalfa mosaic virus. We have, and this I think is, so here you see how it's ALMV, like, uh, you know, this was from 1997, accepted actually in 1996. So um, that was a while ago. <laughs> um, so this is probably, I think this is actually an old designator for alfalfa mosaic. We've got cucumber mosaic virus. We've got broad bean wilt faba virus, we've got Arabis mosaic nepo virus, and then we've got raspberry ring spot nepo virus, potato virus X, potato virus Y, and tomato spotted wilt tosp. And, and so these are the genera tospa virus, podivirus, potex virus. Oh, sorry, just raspberry ring spot virus and Arabis mosaic virus, but it's a nepo virus, and there you go. So these are the genera. And, Were these um, identified in cannabis? So uh, good. So here, I just want to show you the, the example here. Yes, many of these were. I want to say all except for one, if I remember correctly. But I want to, there's a table here. Right, OK. So let me see if I remember. There's I, one of these tables is a little bit more obvious than the other. Maybe we even have some German. Uh, speaking chat that want to fish me out of this fryer. Actually, I think it is this table. Um, so the pluses, I think, wasn't one of them not though? I thought maybe one of them wasn't. Hmm. Well, at least you can see the, the, the account if you guys are interested. I can send this to anyone who wants to, but um, yeah, I think actually pre all of these are all but one. See, these negative marks mean, mean no, and the positives mean yes. So I think the, the um, potato virus Y, cucumber mosaic virus, and the alpha mosaic virus were positive. So it looks like virus, symptom, amount of virus, symptom percentage, 
I don't know what ruck test is, but then I don't biologish. So like the I think it's like the the so yeah, so was it um like the so this is the serial so serologish, right? <laughs> I think that's like the serology and the biology. Um but uh I would have liked to so reaction. So this is reaction of uh hemp uh varieties and oh and this was the cult of this is the variety right here uh is that of inoculation with the plant virus yeah i think so we're getting there this is our broken uh, german episode <laughs> for anybody yes. out there yes uh if if i make any errors just let me know um i did have a translation of this somewhere i i, tra I, I did a little google translate and it was quite helpful um, but I don't have it on me. But uh, yeah, so they definitely tested for these. And I do think that, yeah, I think that many of these were actually uh, found to be the case. Now, I, I do want to say one thing about this. Basically, um, just because you can show it in a lab doesn't mean that it happens in practice, in the field, or in general, in nature. Um, but it doesn't mean but that, I guess I'm not trying to say that like, it doesn't mean it's not possible or anything. And personally, if I see that it's possible, even theoretically, like in the laboratory setting, that's good enough for me usually to, to put it on my, on my like, you know, consideration list. Um, but the only reason why I bring this up is because other people who are virologists and pathologists have, have uh, long talked about how you can't just let a laboratory example be, um, be like the one and only test because it's possible that for really complex and varied reasons, different pathogens, not just viruses, might just not typically colonize certain kinds of hosts. Maybe because the vector doesn't feed on that plant, for example. Uh, I mentioned the white fly, specifically white fly before with all those different viruses that it vectors. And then I also mentioned the like situation where they change the, the the, the gene that allowed another virus that doesn't normally transmit to be transmitted and bind with the cells um, uh, in the in the in the gut and um, so like yeah so like just because something like that could happen doesn't mean that it will happen and that's a more extreme case but I think you know where I'm going with this right I think that's a good point. I just want to remind the chat, uh, join the live chat. I was in top chat there for a little bit and uh, hit that thumbs up. We got 126 with us right now. They're definitely science minded folks because we went from like 105 to 126 after we started pulling up white papers. People seem to like that uh, cannabis science related stuff. So hit that thumbs up and it'll go from like 123 now to like 130 and uh, push it out to more people. And uh, it's, it's crazy when a bunch of people hit the like at the same time, it like pushes it on and people are like, oh shit, they're streaming. Maybe I should go hang out. So uh, get those people in here so we can uh, keep on chatting for this last half an hour or so and uh, having a good time. I know I'm having a good time with the live chat. There's been tons of interaction. This show, even I think more so than ever uh, in the live chat where people are asking questions and getting answers back and forth. But a lot of it's been coming onto the show as well. So I'm always really happy to see that engagement. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think that really uh, makes the show a lot more enjoyable to listen to for the listeners out there who wants to listen to a show where we just ignore you the whole time. It's We do that a lot of the time. So sometimes we'll bring you in more and, uh, you know, Australian Grown, Chad Westport, good to see you guys. Sergeant Bone, uh, Eagle Gardens, cheers to you. Saw Smiley earlier. Thunder Dan, Anova, just big ups. Uh, happy to see everybody as always and always, uh, you know, appreciative of the community who comes out each week. Um, can't you know, understate our thankfulness for everybody's support and uh, continued, you know, showing up. And Matthew, I think we're still on the single speaker view right now. So if I don't know if you want to rehost me or if you just want to click on view and go to uh, gallery. So, oh, I stopped uh, um, showing my screen. Oh, but I didn't stop being host. I forgot. It's okay. So we should be able to, as host, Jack, you should be able to just assign people co host and then the co host can also share their screen, I think. You were now host. I've seen other people do that, but whenever I right click, it says mute, stop video, chat, pin, uh, make host, rename, allow record, allow to multi pin. You have to go to the uh, options panel in the on the Zoom on the like not on here. On Pick the, the person, I think. Yeah, um, on the website. Right? It's, in the, it's in the account settings uh, on the actual page where you go through all your stuff. But before you make the the same page, you go to make your meetings and stuff like that. Okay, I see. Um, yeah, it's all right. I think 
I think we get by for the most part. With that. I have a yeah. I have a small excerpt translation from the abstract of that paper that I think will tell, will give a little bit more context for what they found. Um, if if it's that, if that's okay. Yeah. Do you want to re share your screen or do you just want to read it out? Oh, I'll it's just funny. read it. It's funny you oh. had that, Matthew, because when you were first pulling that up and you were like kind of walking through it, I was thinking in my head to jump in and say, why don't you just like copy and Google paste translate? It, Google it. translate. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> no, it was a good question. No, it was a good idea, honestly. Um, so um, basically, some of it was translated, by the way, already on the paper. Small pieces. Um, but, but really the crucial parts, I think, like the name of the virus in English. So uh, there's a part where they're, they're talking about how little is known about hemp viruses. They mentioned a, a Gitman and a, a Schmidt and a Carl, um, who in, this, in the late 60s and early 70s um, showed that various, various viruses could be transmitted into, into hemp. Um, they found that the cucumber mosaic virus, alfalfa mosaic virus, uh, caused like a light green leaf spotting and yellow, yellowish banding in hemp. Uh, they say that the Arabis mosaic virus in the plants in the Potsdam region. Oh, I, I think this is actually a, a mistranslated um, idiosyncrasy here. But yeah, it looks like a lot of these viruses kind of cause like a yellowing in leaves, like a lot of viruses do, and, and spotting, which might be like a modeling potentially, although they don't use the word for modeling. Um, yeah, so it looks like mo- much of those viruses were in fact uh, confirmed in this uh, in this laboratory report. But, but like I, I said, I like question just oh, on, yeah. on viruses in general. Um, if if you suspect a virus or, or a plant was affected by a virus, what precautions do you need to take? Uh, I'm sure you have to dispose of that plant. But what um, I mean, do I have to be crazy about not like? bring a bag with me into the place and put it right straight into a bag to make sure I don't touch anything with it. Is it that crazy? Or I can cut it down as long as I don't use those same tools on something else before like dunk them in ISO or something. Very that good could. questions. For me. It definitely depends on uh, what virus. Cause in some, in a lot of cases, viruses aren't mechanically transmitted. And in that case, I would just trash it. But uh, I think it's always a good idea to, to take it seriously um even for like other pathogens too like fu- fungi is sometimes difficult like powdery mildew and stuff because the spores get everywhere and it's kind of impossible to really be that careful to some degree um but like the most careful you can is like to like bag it and like and, and take it out kind of like don't shake it around or or get it close to other plants and, and that sort of a thing if that's possible even. like turn your fans off <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that with um, and viroid i think um medi cropper ended up using a system where they'd have like each worker would have two or three sets of scissors and two of them would be sitting, you'd have like a red set, a green set and a blue set. Two of them are sitting in alcohol and like, I'm working on this plant, whether I know it's got tobacco mosaic or whatever, uh, hoplite and virate or whatever it is or not, I cut that plant only with these shears. And as soon as I'm done with that plant, I dunk them in the alcohol. I move to the next plant and I go from red to green. And then I go from green to blue. And by the time you've gotten back to that first set, they've been soaking hopefully in alcohol and maybe it'll help. But I've heard some people say alcohol has mixed effectiveness against certain things. But um, it was just something I thought I'd bring up because I think that can help prevent some issues for sure. That's that's actually the SOPs that I use for all the cloning that I do for all my clients um, is actually that that exact same blade rotation. And I've seen multiple facilities where you can see I can go to the mom room and find the two strains that had mosaic. But by the time I go down to the flowering room, there's a lot more than those two strains that have that mosaic because they ain't been cleaning their trimmers. And you can walk them backwards through the whole grow and show them exactly the progression of the mosaic virus through the facility. And they'll still tell you it's not mosaic. I've done that three separate times. The other cool thing, actually, and I I don't want to give away. I got to be careful because I don't want to give away where this was because I have mad respect to the grower, but um, there, I was at a grow in a state that doesn't have a whole lot of grows right now. It's not the one in Georgia, this is the other state I was in. Um, and uh, uh, cause people are gonna immediately think that one. Uh, but well, I was there's only, only so state. many red states. So be careful uh, yeah. disqualifying because there's only like five red states anymore. Uh, I go to most yes. of them, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, they had different types of lights with the same cuts on four separate rows. So each row had the same set of configuration of combos of strains. 
but four different light sets on, on, on tracks in the same room. Uh, and what was really interesting to me was seeing how the you could see plain as day how the one light was causing an increase in mosaic virus expression in just the one strain. And you could literally see it going down the increase in expression from how much it was getting that light or getting some side light from one of the other ones. And how I, it, to me, there was some aspect, uh, and I, I begged the guy to let me take pictures and he wouldn't let me take pictures, but um, uh, the uh, uh, it was interesting to me that light could have possibly been the stress factor causing the mosaic virus uh, to do the expression because I had never ever thought about my lights being the cause of it. Uh, can I, so can I was, estimate what was a the guess? Bad light? I, yeah, I want to give a guess light? before you tell me because I, ha I have a, a very strong guess, I think, about this. I would bet that the LED or the highest performance light was what is going to make the plant express it more because it seems like when you're overclocking or overdriving, that makes the nutrient deficiency show up first. That makes the stress show up first. So with this virus, I would imagine under an LED or a high powered light, that was probably the most uh, visible, so, but I could be wrong. So the all, viruses of using, all of them are using LEDs where they could adjust the light spectrum and it was the same fixture on all three rows. They had them set at different light spectrums. That was the the difference. So the, the oh, motion shit. different. So, and they were all LEDs um and so what was um, unique about that spectrum was it so yeah which or, spectrum of the spectra was the i i'm not sure I don't know. Uh, I, I, that was or, the most, well, one of those red right till, one of it was right red the, mm. the, the the virus what what's that i'm sorry will uv light kill the some some tobacco mosaic virus <clears throat> I don't think that's necessarily the case because, well, and that's not the one that we're trying to fight really from what it sounds like all the other ones are expressing in cannabis, but that one so far as what we know. Or yeah. Nice. Any virus that hemp gets, if you use like the UVC light, well, you know, like the ones that they say white, you know, they sell for PM and stuff. Yeah. I mean, um, you shouldn't be using those. <laughs> UVC wands without live protection and skin protection. I don't know. Like people need. Yeah, to you gotta wear gloves, fucking everything. Yeah, UVC is, is when you no gotta joke. have that much PPE. Uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah I don't, I'm not interested. Dutch greenhouses uh, though have a bar that swipes over the entire crop because they have a lot stricter regulations on pesticides and things like that. And um, they have them hover over flowers, cucumbers, a whole, whole bunch of different stuff because they have to grow almost everything in greenhouse. They have a lot of rain and high PM and mold conditions. So they've used that effectively on literal booms that just swipe over the canopy and they only are sit sitting in one spot for X amount of seconds. So it's not damaging. I like that because then you don't even have to be in there. So that's super safe. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um I mean, the metabolism of the plant, I think that's kind of what's happening, right? With like the light spectra, per perhaps, potentially. Like if the plant's growing faster, if there's, there's more metabolic activity, then because the virus relies so much on, you know, the cells to propagate the virus itself, it's hijacking that cellular, um, you know, machinery. So um, on the one hand, like, there's cases where viruses get into like particles and they get swept up in the air and they move, uh, you know, vast distances and they're protected by like, you know, like flecks of dirt and things like that. Cause they're so dang small. And so like UV and other sorts of things can, or are sort of like interfered with. Uh, but if they're just kind of laying flat on a surface, yeah, I think that the, the ultraviolet radiation is probably quite deleterious. Like I said, a lot of viruses are not very stable outside of their host and, and this is one of the bigger stressors that they have to deal with that kills them. I have a question yeah. about expression. Uh, you were talking about septoria earlier, uh, but I'm more interested in, um, I've seen some variegation in cannabis that almost looks like it could be a mosaic or some people mistake it for mosaic. But what are your guys' thoughts on, is uh, variegation something that you're seeing in cannabis? Is it a genetic occurrence or is that likely or uh, possibly caused by a virus or viroid? Well, if yeah, it's there's... variegated, it's, I would say it's not caused by a virus, like kind of definitionally, but that's just like a terminology thing. But yeah, you can get uh, like sport mutations and variegations that look a lot like um, what we, what we call like a, or what like certain like virus modeling and, and things like that are. And there's always the famous story of the, um, the virus mania in, in the Dutch with the tulips, tulip mania. And uh, they were like... breeding to... If it's would. just variegation, it'll most likely be on one leaf. And if it's a virus, oh. will it <clears throat> cover more? 
Well, uh, maybe most likely, but it could some... be on more than one. But sometimes, you know what I'm saying? I have yeah. Some like side by sides here. In fact, do you guys have screen share on? I can. No. Whoever I'll make you the host. But with I'll a make virus, you the host. Does it cover the plant, or is it you know smaller? It's is kind it, of um... a, like we were saying earlier. It's kind of a virulence question. If the virus is virulent okay. enough, then yeah. If Take the virus over, is if it's not right. Is, yeah, if it's not super, so like potential, but yeah, I agree with you. Most of the time, I don't feel like viruses, usually if the virus isn't very good at like spreading throughout the plant, um, then I would say that the plant's usually in a really superior position, but it, I feel like it's usually the opposite, kind of like what you're surmising that like, usually if a virus is good enough to like really infect a great part of the plant, uh, a lot of viruses are lethal enough or virulent enough to really um, get to the rest of the plant, but you know, not always. I really this like to me this. is is so obviously different. Um, yeah. I can definitely recognize variegation is a lot different than mosaic virus or oh, whatever yeah. the thing on the left. This is, is a perfect yeah. example. This is how I explain it to people, like people at work or whatever, and they ask me, I'm like, a virus is going to look like the plant is fucking not happy. Look at those leaves; they're all twisted and fucked up. Whereas the variegation, those plants, are, those leaves are a different color, but they're still healthy outside of the color I mean, this is more like chlorosis yeah uh, at least on the top leaves on the bottom yeah. it's a little bit more you know this is a very it's usually a special fifth, kind of as I, say, I usually see it half down like the leaf half and half is what i see underneath the leaf is like that you can see uh, i saw somebody who had some of dj shorts work um has that variegation fairly often in it and i saw a guy who had a hundred percent i've i think i bookmarked it on my instagram so hopefully i can find it i think i've seen oh yeah there you that's go. more common right there is what i'd see there you go yeah and I would call I that like a sport mutation. My I've seen that, what I've seen even more often is just one blade looking like that middle. Where it's just one blade of the five or whatever the, there are. That's the rule of it. thumb for me for like sort of mosaic patterning and things like that is that like like Spartan said really eloquently, like there's gonna be kind of like a confluence of symptoms. And yeah, that's a great picture to bring it up on. If the virus even has symptoms like this then yeah, there's like, there's like a mixture. There's kind of like this, like, uh, like modeling, like you said, like kind of a mixture and coloration. Whereas the other, other picture is like very kind of defined. And I think that's because usually that's a genetic, just kind of a little sport genetic mutation. And sometimes people even breed for that in other plants. Right. And so, uh, I know there's a lot yeah. of people who like to grow aeroids and, uh, charge people hundreds of dollars for it's insane. variegation. It's insane. It's insane I know. Steve, <laughs> so this, that, is the that, um, this is the crazy plant. Did, did it grow to maturity and they harvested it or did they kill it and take it away? That, that fucked up one? Yeah. We, we finished it out because it was already in flower, but that was... Yeah, I saw it had it had flower and some resin on it. So, And, and is it smoke normal or is it like black uh, charcoal-y ash? Or... So, so as far as smoking, it's okay. I mean, there's nothing that wrong with it to smoke. It's just that the bud, it retards growth, right? So the buds it's don't ever really really develop, flimsy. Right? And they, okay. the buds can stay kind of small and larfy and they don't really develop, right? So it's it's not, even as a commercial, even if it's cool looking commercially wise, it's not worth it for the yield loss. Right. It's, it's more prudent to cut it out and replace it with a better plant. It'll only be worth it once um, ornamental cannabis cultivation like when people start growing freak show and, and selling plants for thousands of dollars for a cut or something yeah, the like bottles. there there was that uh monster terra that was variegated that just sold for thousands of dollars a few weeks or months back uh this is caledonian grown he has one of the most variegated it almost looks like an albino plant to me um looking at this one it's in flower right here in this photo i'm going to click on their profile because i think there's more recent ones but that was a shared or saved post that i had made I think this might be the variegated plant. I got to jump out real quick, guys. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Spartan. I no forgot it's totally uh, past your time, but uh, give your final thoughts and shout outs and then uh, make sure to go support him on Michigan Bros. Grow Show here in about 12 minutes. Yeah, I'll just make it short and sweet. I'm, uh, I got to run, but uh, yep, you can catch me at Michigan Bros. Grow Show coming up here in a few minutes, well, about 10 minutes or so. And uh, that's on the Michigan Bros. Grow Show or the Mish Bros grow show channel i don't know how the hell they spelled it it is mish bros grow show m-i-c-h okay. period yeah, bros grow do? show glad but, you made uh, it tonight Spartan. yeah i'm glad I, I did too guys uh it was awesome hanging with you shout out to chat love you guys and uh we'll catch y'all next week Throws thank up. you so much for joining find them at spartan grown and you can email spartan grown at gmail.com and also make sure to check out mitt canico where they're crushing it commercially over there in michigan thanks for joining us sure. spartan
Jack, that's really interesting. That that uh, variegated or albino is all the buds on it go up a little. It turns pink. It starts getting yeah, uh, some carotenoids real, or some anthocyanin. Real cool color. Yeah, I wonder about this because um, you know, like uh, you know, there there are other like chlorophylls, right? Or or maybe that's not the right word. Um, yeah, the different kinds of chlorophylls, right? Yeah, and for different it's colors. Just, it's lacking too. chlorophyll. I mean, they think that this plant just has a chlorophyll deficiency or something. And it, well, like the green, the the yeah, yeah. Is, isn't green. all chlorophyll green? I could be incorrect on that. I feel it's like there's the chloroplast that makes it uh, green, but there's also other um, chemical constituents like carotenoids. Lycopene is one of them that makes tomatoes red. So no, there's no, no, yeah, those... I, mean that, I mean that like there are, there are like you said, they're like chloroplast. Like so, like the light reflects. Like the reason why they're green is because they're reflecting green light, they're right? Called they're called chromo- other stuff. Cr- they're called chromoplasts. Chromoplasts, right? And so I think what we're seeing are the red ones. So uh, the red a Japanese ones. maple has purple maybe leaves, but it still photosynth- photosynthesizes, correct? Yeah, and so does cannabis that has purple leaf. But right. This is a so, white leaf. so do plants with black leaves, for example. All right. So. Photosynthesis is black absorbs green. light though, so that makes sense to me. White is reflecting of light, which right. does not make a lot of sense evolutionarily for me. Like if you look at the bud, it's tiny. It didn't photosynthesize as much as the green buds that you see right yeah. next to it on his same page. They're thicker, they're more filled out. Those white buds are clearly they're popcorn. They're very, very small. And this is no offense to him. It's genetic in that plant. I think that it it doesn't have the ability to photosynthesize as much personally. That's just my own opinion on it, but it, it looks beautiful. I would have kept it too. Shit. This it's is a pretty. Cool ass, we're talking about it and it's a worthwhile conversation. And he is, because he has great taste in ginger beer. So you have to agree with him. I don't really uh, have to agree with ginger beer drinking there, but I will say stone <laughs> makes some, or I don't know if that's stone. That was a ginger different beer. beer is great. I like ginger beer. I like it was really yeah. spicy. That's what I like. Yeah, there's I like one spicy called- ginger. There's one we use for our our um, our drinks, uh, and it's called Cock and Bull. Yeah, that's Cock and Bull. Yeah. Is there a difference stuff. between ginger beer and root beer? Uh, yeah, yes. one's made with ginger. No. Ginger oh, okay. is they were really good. spicy. Uh, I mean, I've had ginger beers that are kind of not to be like a Wild. connoisseur or whatever, but like, yeah, like sometimes I feel like the ginger beers are lacking in the spice. And so yeah, and like I think ginger ale, like the Canadian dry isn't spicy at all. It's like yeah, not the same. If you're gonna make a mule, make it with cock and bull. That's what I have to say about that, I guess. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, but that's but thanks for bringing up the terminology, Brandon. Um, yeah, like I and I, you're right, it might be carotenoids, it might be um the what do you call them? The chroma chromoplasts. They're yeah. like chloroplasts, but they operate on a different uh different wavelengths i think the part of the uh part of a different photosystem than the photosystem one i th- think if i if i'm re- remembering it properly i was just about yeah, to say i got some curly top there and then i checked over in the zoom chat and uh, oh, potent bonus yeah. rights i have some good curly top picks as well and uh those are definitely devastating to see that's like oh yeah I would say mid to later stage but uh, it's definitely gonna get way worse from there oh yeah here hold on i'll show you more progress one second yeah, this is a great. These these are great photos for people who have never seen breed curly top virus in their plants. It looks very similar to these symptoms in, in severe cases. Yeah, so here's like the final form. This is what it'll do at the end. Let's see how yeah, it you just see how, bunches it all up like that. Yeah, it like curls in on itself. You know, like it's very tightly like wound. It looks like it's um, trying to protect itself from light almost like when they get light stress where they're like folding up over top of itself. And like, it, it's almost like you're covering your head with your arms or something, you know, like that's like the, how the plant looks like it's reacting to me. It's like, what the fuck's like coming, but it's a virus or a viroid uh, beat curly top virus. Right. So it seemed to always be able to find a few of these in Oregon and, o- and Oklahoma. If you're doing acres and acres and acres, you're just going to get a handful that are going to get it. You know, it's just, the, the leaf hoppers or whatever uh, leaf hopper vector you correct me if i'm wrong right Matt, yeah Matthew. yeah it's um uh the beet leaf hopper colorado has a lot of it too unfortunately yeah. colorado arizona are the two papers in that beet curly top video i made for cannabis um but it's it's all around globally uh massive massive 
um, problem. That virus causes like billions of dollars of damage annually. And it's in California and other parts of North America too. So as people grow up more and more, like Steve says, um, you know, this is the case that we will see more of it. And um, I had actually somebody contact me recently. I think they were even kind of connected to the USDA uh, or, or they were like maybe working with the USDA themselves. But um, yeah, they were seeing a little bit in their crops, but I asked them what they were doing about it. And they said that uh, they didn't get, a, they weren't seeing a whole lot of the symptoms in their hemp which to me is actually kind of amazing. Um, it makes me wonder, maybe it's resistance because usually beet leaf hoppers are really problematic. They only need to feed once to transmit the virus and the virus doesn't take that long to show symptoms if it's going to. Um, but it was kind of endearing to hear that that person had not really, uh, in, a, in a massive swath of, of hemp, not really seen a lot of the symptoms. So that's kind of a Matthew. cool, endearing thing. Yeah, Maybe not yet, at least. And maybe Have they ever uh tried to or succeeded in making vaccines for plants for viruses oh jesus <laughs> <laughs> um there so plant physiology is very different from like animal physiology uh they don't have a circulatory system quite like ours but i think that we're probably not the first one to have such a conception um they've injected in a, in a way, Bassiana, right yeah in, in a way yeah in a way inoculating with um like people, when they do inoculation tests with like, like Jack says, like with Bouveria, they literally will like take a needle and put that in the plant and like, you know, inject it. Um, so that's like, that is a thing people Close do. Close as it that's, gets. Yeah. You, you know, it's in there that way, right? You can right. spray it on the outside and hope it permeates, or you could stick a needle in there and jam it right into the main line of the plant, you know? It seems I, to work. I, but... I made a, a, a video about um, Rapalosiphum patty virus and that is a virus that infects various aphids including uh ropalciphum rufio dominale which is the rice root aphid um and it can it, apparently it can subsist in certain plant hosts for like a couple of weeks at most um but it keeps getting it can be keep getting reinfested by other other aphids um but anyways it, it doesn't kill the plant the aphid outright it harms their ribosomes and a, the reproduction goes down, their physiology goes down. I wondered if that could be possible. People could intentionally inoculate their plants to like, you know, really screw up the aphid population, but we'll see. All righty. Well, with that being said, Matthew, um, you just mentioned your YouTube. Can you tell the people where your YouTube channel can be found? Cause we are wrapping it up final three minutes and then uh, we'll close it out. Absolutely. So if you're curious about that video, you can check it out on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. You can also find my posts about various plant health topics on Instagram at Sync Angel and on Twitter at Sync Angel. Thanks for the shout out on Twitter, Jack, by the way. No problem. Whenever I see a pest content that I think uh, you would be able to, or have already made a video for, I like to uh, plug it and tag you and then, you know, give some other people the insight that like, Hey, you know, you have this issue. There's a guy out there who makes videos on how to solve it. So here it is. And, uh, you know, let you know that I shared it so that uh, he can give you the credit and hopefully uh, you guys link up there. But um, next up we have Steve from Potent Ponics. Hey, you guys can find me at the Growing on Fishes podcast on your favorite podcast app. Uh, and you can also find me on uh, November 13th and 14th at the uh, free uh, virtual online um, aquaponic cannabis conference. In fact, Matthew will be speaking on, on insects and, and other pathogens as well. So uh, don't be sure not to miss it. Definitely going to tune into that and check it out. Can't beat free and great information as always. I love Potent Ponics myself. I've been a listener for a long time and enjoy the show. So happy to have you whenever I see your name pop up in the chat or uh, here live with us on the Zoom. Next up, we got Brandon Rust. Well, sorry guys. Uh, what's going on? Uh, it was good to be here. I'll see everybody next week. Uh, you can find me at rust.brandon on Instagram gram you can find link to my company bokashi earthworks and to my farm and i'm really excited to announce that ed rosenthal is going to be coming up to my farm november 10th that's really going to be awesome that's really cool i would just uh you know be careful if you're doing any business deals with them i would caution that but uh interesting character long lot a lot of history in the cannabis community um and it's very interesting that you'll get to meet him so 
I wish you the best in that interaction. And uh, I hope everything goes very well for you with that. And last and certainly not least, the American one. Jack, as always, thanks for hosting. You did a bang up job as usual. Um, I'll say, Rust, if you see Ed, tell him uh, Gavison is not the man for California, but I digress. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone has a great week. You all know me. I'm the American one. You can find me on uh, the American one underscore with underscore Keens over at the IGs where I mostly hang out. I got a little bit of stuff on YouTube. I still always am lying and saying I'm going to put more stuff up, but I don't. So I apologize for that. I don't think everybody's that interested. But if you have any questions or you want to hit me up, just hit me up. And uh, yeah, peace out, everybody. Well, they should be interested. That Amy Ace is some really fire shit. And so is the Ophelia and a lot of the other strains that you've put out there to the community. People seem to really love it. I'm, uh, yeah, Jack, I think Amy. next week I want to do a stealth giveaway. We won't go into it, but next week we'll do a stealth giveaway of some beans for me. It'll be a uh, perfect time because we're actually having another reader with us next week, uh, Full Duplex AFN, who's now known as Gnome Genetics, I believe, Gnome Autoflowers. They used to be Mandalorian Genetics, great autoflower breeder, will be joining us next week uh, again. So looking forward to that. And with that being said, uh, it's the six o'clock hour out here on the West Coast. I'm Jack Greenstock, as you can see here behind me on Instagram, as well as Cannabis, the cannabis friendly social media app. And you can also find me on Twitter, Jack underscore Greenstock, or email me, jackgreenstock47 at gmail.com. If you want a copy of 50 Strains of Green, go to 50strains.com. That's the best place to get it in the U.S. or internationally. And uh, with that said, you can also find us on your favorite podcast app. I'm going to take the next half an hour to write up a little description for this episode and upload it through my anchor, which pushes it out to all the other podcasts. So thank you all for joining us, and we'll catch you next week. Uh, for Dr. MJ, growers love. Peace and love, y'all. Jack Greenstock signing out. I'll see you guys all next week.